Welcome to High Lawn Baptist Church in St. Albans, West Virginia, where our mission is to know Christ and to make Christ known. We pray that you are blessed by the sharing of God's truth for us this day. For more information, visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Scripture is Isaiah 9, 2, 6, and 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Hope. This is what prayer is all about. It's coming together around the promise. This is what celebration is all about. It is lifting up what is already there. This is what communion is all about. It's saying thank you. For the seed that has been planted. It is saying, we are waiting for the Lord who has already come. The whole meaning of the Christian community lies in offering a space in which we wait for that which we have already seen. Christian community is the place where we keep the flame alive among us and take it seriously so that it can grow and become stronger in us. In this way, we can live with courage trusting that there is a spiritual power in us that allows us to live in this world without being seduced constantly by despair, lostness, and darkness. That is how we dare to say that God is God of love, even when we see hatred all around us. That is why we can claim that God is a God of life, even when we see death and destruction and agony all around us. We say it together. We affirm it in one another, waiting together, nurturing what has already begun, expecting its fulfillment. This is the meaning of marriage, friendship, community, and the Christian life. Blessing of the candle. We light this candle as a symbol of hope where we remember the longing of the generations who lived before the birth of Jesus, and we hold fast to our faith in expectation of his return. May the light sent from God continually fill our souls with hope and shine in the darkness to show our world the way to salvation. Hope is not just in wishing for something. If you're a Christian, if you've been called by God, if you've been saved by him, then hope isn't just a wish. Hope is a certainty. It's a certainty that hasn't happened yet, but it's still a certainty. Because as we've said time and time again, we don't have a God that is capricious. We don't have a God that is an Indian giver. We don't have a God who will be one way and then change his mind the next because we know through the testimony of Scripture that our God is the same today as he was yesterday and will be what? Tomorrow, forevermore. Incidentally, we've gotten out of the habit of that, so if, if I do that long pause, please go ahead and fill in the blanks. That does two things. Number one, that helps me to know that you're paying attention. But number two, it's a method of worship, call and response. It means that if you respond back to me, your mouth trains your brain, then you've got it. So as we come into Scripture, go ahead and repeat it back to me. I won't take your birthday away, I promise. But hope is not fleeting. The Christian hope is built on two things, the faithfulness of God and the witness of those that have gone before us. And for those of us who have made a habit of regularly reading the Word of God, eventually you'll come across not only the testimony of those that have gone before and God's faithfulness to them, but you'll come across a couple of, of strange words. And those words get brought up in Scripture again and again. The words are the times and the seasons. To our ears, that kind of sounds repetitive. It sounds as though the writers are telling us the same thing with two different words. But 
what we need to pay attention to is that when the word of God is repetitive, when it seems to say something the same way twice, pay attention. It's the Holy Spirit's way of drawing you to a special truth. That truth usually lies in, in very, very subtle differences. The Word of God teaches us in Genesis chapter 1 that the stars were created by God to allow us to record the times and seasons. Christ tells his newly commissioned apostles in Acts 1 7 when they ask him, When will God, when will you restore the kingdom? Jesus tells them that it's not your place to know the times and seasons. When you dig a little deeper, you see that these words actually translate better as moments and opportunities, occasions and opportunities. They signify something more akin to the unfolding of time and the opportunities that God himself places along our journey. Opportunities for him to intervene in our lives, opportunities for us to engage in ministry. His opportunities to bless us and our opportunities to be a blessing. To farmers, it means opportunities to sow and to harvest. To travelers, it means opportunities to journey and to rest to the people of God. Opportunities to see him at work and then become engaged in his work. To respond to the call of ministry and be the hands and feet of Christ. To grow in grace and knowledge. Opportunities to mature in sanctification as we minister in God's name. It's one of the reasons I keep repeating the phrase, love God, share his word, love others, spread the gospel. That's progressive sanctification. We start out in worship, and that excites us. We delve into God's word, and we become stronger in his word. We get nourished by his word, and that excites us, and we get bounded into bringing God's mercy into the world. And that gives us a testimony that we then share that's growing in maturity, that's sanctification. The story of the Bible is one long testimony about the coming of God into our midst. Emmanuel, God with us. A pageant of building opportunities, the setting of a stage so that God could enter his creation at just the right time and offer redemption and salvation. Take out your copy of God's Word with me and turn to the book of Galatians. Paul's letter to the Galatian church, chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Galatians 4, 1, we read, What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave. In other words, he doesn't have a real station. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. Also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of this world. In other words, the time wasn't yet. Our ancestors wandered in darkness. The people of God were waiting, were yearning, were calling out for a Savior that would free them from their sin. Wouldn't just offer an atonement that would last only so long, but would change their hearts. Created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Not just to clean out my heart, but give me a new one. But when the, time, when the set time had fully come, in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, You're a child of God, God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. So Heavenly Father, as we bow our hearts before you this morning, we ask that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word, that you would allow us to be filled with your hope, that you would create a revival within us so that when we come to this season, when we prepare ourselves to receive Christ 
We don't only think of the little child born in Bethlehem. But we also see your son on the cross. But not only the cross, but the empty tomb. And not only the empty tomb, but the returning King of kings and Lord of lords. We long for the day that every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So Lord, as we declare our hope to you now, enrich it, multiply it, and teach us to enter your gates truly with thanksgiving in our hearts, in your courts with praise, because we know that you are the ultimate victor and that we are your children. And it's in the matchless name of Christ we pray. And all God's people said, our story is that of a people who were walking in darkness, trapped in centuries of sin, whole civilizations that had lost the knowledge of the one true and living God. Millions of our ancestors who were blinded to the truth that there is only one God and he's not made of stone or wood or metal. When the first couple in a desire to make themselves into gods, when they yielded to the temptation of pride, when they realized what they had done, they fled from the presence of the creator and tried to hide their sin and guilt by their own works, sowing fig leaves for themselves to try to cover their own shame, working for salvation, in other words. But God saw their condition. He saw their separation from holiness. He saw through their disguise, the stain on their innocence. And in a fury, the earth itself was cursed. But out of love, God gave a promise to Eve and a warning to the enemy. A savior would come by the seed of a woman. And even though that deliverer would have to suffer, he would be victorious and crush the head of the serpent of old. Then God took pity on the couple in realizing their inability to make an atonement for themselves God himself covered their shame, sacrificing innocent life to take that sin away from his sight. Do you see the pattern for me? Do you see what Genesis is setting up? The foreshadowing of things to come. You would think that mankind would become pious and try to live a more just life in God's sight. But instead of earnestly attempting to recapture their righteousness as humanity multiplied and filled the earth, so did temptation and sin. Now living fully in darkness, their disdain for God and their hatred for each other culminated in God wishing, actually saying in the word of God that he had repented of creating them in the first place. Can you imagine what it was like? Yet out from the bloodshed, out from that sin, there was still a family, one family on the surface of the planet who remembered God. And although they themselves weren't perfect, they still offered sacrifices and they still tried to live a life that was faithful to their creator. And when God rescued that family from the flood of his anger, in humility and submission to his divine will, they offered a sacrifice of praise and dedication, their hearts filled with gratitude and submission and selflessness and dedication. And then God set a rainbow in the sky as a reminder of those very things. Humility. Sacrifice. Dedication. My, how things change when the people of God don't stand their ground. Then new generations were born. And they built a great city. And again, as time passed, they forgot God. They made for themselves gods after their own image. And actually stood against heaven themselves, itself. So God scattered them throughout the earth because even though they were united, they were united in a spirit of pride. Still not having learned the lesson from the Garden of Eden, they sought to overthrow God and claim heaven for themselves. So in their strength, God looked down, saw what they were doing, and he scattered them through the course of the nations. Their strength was taken away and their anger for God was replaced with an anger against each other. And war became their legacy. 
that God still loved them. God selected a man from among the people and called his family from out of Babylon's region, the city of sin, to a new land where they could settle and build a nation that would bring knowledge of God back into this world. Through a famine, the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob entered Egypt as servants and lived there as slaves. And in their anguish from their slavery and hopelessness and fear, God heard their cries and sent a deliverer to pull them out of their powerlessness and into his strength. He would send a man under his own power. Uh, He would send a man who in his own power was quote-unquote clumsy with words. But God would give this fallible man new words. He would use him as his own mouthpiece. God would use him to speak words to his chosen people, to bring the voice of God to a sinful creation. Are you starting to see the connection? The pattern. From the slavery to Egypt, they became a nation. God himself was their king. God provided the law which put his holiness and ethics for living on display before the whole world, calling them a a kingdom of priests, God gave them a means of worship where they could substitute the blood of an innocent life as payment for their sin debt. For the wages of sin is, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness from. Okay, so we see the pattern starting to form. And because God, because God came into their midst and tried to experience fellowship with them, This longing for a personal connection with God is taking root in their hearts. And under the covering of atonement, the people of God were able to finally stand before his presence, have fellowship with God, bring their prayers before God, have a relationship with God, God using the events of history to reveal the pathway of redemption that he himself was setting up to put a tapestry before us where the thread of grace binds all of it together. God himself was their king. And he sent prophets to guide them in his name. Yet animal sacrifices alone couldn't change the human heart. The people turned from him and again worshiped themselves. Under the reign of the judges, they lived by doing what was right in their own eyes. And so they spiraled out of control time and time again, growing greedy in their prosperity and proud in their hearts. They drifted away from God and started to worship themselves. So they showed God that they no longer needed him. That was their message. So God would leave them to their own devices. And the enemies that he had protected them from would attack and made them slaves in the promised land. They would finally realize their sin. They would cry out for, uh, they would cry out in repentance, and God would raise up a deliverer and rescue them. They would rededicate themselves and remain faithful, but only for a time. Then they would grow prosperous. Then they would get greedy, and they would forget about God's love that gave them that prosperity in the first place. And so God would take his hand of protection away. And the cycle would continue, getting worse and worse and worse with each repetition. So when the crowd rejected the prophets, when Israel stood and finally said, enough, we don't want, God is our king, he then again left them to their own devices, and God granted their wish and sent human kings to rule and protect them. But with that power came corruption. Even the good kings, when temptation was more powerful than their connection with God, the whole nation suffered as a result of that sin. Their human nature was magnified. Their sin became a burden for all the people of God. And so God would again send prophets to call them back to the law, to righteousness, to call them back to himself. Sometimes they heard the call of the prophets, but far too often, 
The prophets were dismissed. The called of God were tortured, brutalized, murdered, as we hear from Christ, all for proclaiming his word, for being an inconvenience. Yet God gave these persecuted prophets hope through a promise, the same promise that he gave Eve all those centuries before. A savior would come to deliver them from slavery to sin. The kingdom of God would come. The day of the Lord would come. And the creator would reconcile creation back to himself. After the kings failed to hold Israel together and the people of God again descended into their own depravity, God lifted his hand of protection and the people returned to slavery. The family of Abraham was ripped away from Jerusalem, the city of God, and was carried away, carted away, chained away, back to Babylon, back to the city of the enemy, the city of sin. But yet again, in spite of all that, God still loved them. And God heard their cries. And when they emerged from slavery this time, they brought with them a renewed conviction to the law. They learned and memorized the Holy Scriptures, and they vowed to never again become so marred in sin that God would ever turn his back on his people. They were zealous for the law, but as the pattern, they grew proud. The teachers became rich and powerful. Many devoted themselves to the law more than to God. They started to worship Torah almost as an addiction. They became so caught up in the word of God that they didn't leave enough time to be with God. They worshiped themselves for their ability to be righteous in their own eyes. They hid their pride behind a mask of false humility and service. They became living proof that even under the law, while a sacrifice can bring atonement for sin, the law cannot change someone's heart away from sin. The pattern was still in full force. Their nature was still fallen. They were slaves to sin, trying to cover themselves in the fig leaves made from Holy Scripture. God used them as an example to show us later on that we can't earn salvation on our own. We can't live a good life under our own power, under our own wisdom, doing things our way. The price was too great, and that road is impossible. The law was too hard. The teachers were hypocrites, and just as they were slaves to sin in their own temple, the Roman armies made the people of God slaves in their own land. This was the world that Christ was brought into. This was the stage that God had set for the coming of his only begotten son. Our situation as we stand before God is that by our own nature, human beings value themselves to the point of worship. When God becomes inconvenient, when we want to do things our way under our own power, doing the things that make us feel good, You've heard the phrase, if it feels good, do it, right? How many have heard that before? Okay. Actually, if it feels good, watch out. Something's wrong. Because what is right is rarely what's easy. As the Bible tells us, sin is crouching at the door in those times. But we handle that by rebellion and by fashioning a God in our own image or trying to refashion the God that we claim to worship into something more tolerant to our wants, claiming that they're really his wants. We fashion a God that will make us powerful, that will look the other way when we are unjust. An ATM machine in the sky Either we do that or we ignore the existence of God altogether and the existence of anything other than ourselves. Even when we try to live a righteous life under our own power, 
We live it to make ourselves look good. The focus is always on us. Pride, the foundation of sin. It's when we take our eyes off of God and put it on ourselves. And then God lets us have it our way. He takes his hand off of us and gives us over to our own devices. Romans 1 calls this leaving the people over to a reprobate mind. You want to disclaim God's sovereignty? Keep at it long enough. And you can have it your way and see what consequences it brings. As Judges tells us, where everyone does what is right in their own eyes, there is the least of real liberty. That was a quote taken from Judges by a man by the name of Brigadier General Henry Martin Robert. He saw that firsthand during the Civil War. Where every man does what is right in their own eyes, there is but the least of real liberty. But the corollary to that we find later in the writings of Paul that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So God gave us a solution for our predicament. God himself would make the way. God's situation is that his creation, made in his image, broke themselves. They used the will given to them to try and wrestle divine power for themselves. The only thing that God is incapable of doing is violating his own nature. And God must answer injustice with justice. He must answer sin with judgment. Sin cannot enter into the presence of God. A sin-stained soul cannot inherit everlasting life. Since the price of sin is what? Death. And since we cannot save ourselves, we stand imperfect before a perfect God. We cannot pay the debt. We cannot live a life holy, righteous, and perfect before God. It's not possible. God would have to find a way to pay the debt while still being holy. I think it was Aristotle. No, Plato. One of the greatest minds of the pagan world who actually said, I believe that it is possible that divinity can forgive sin, but I cannot see how. This is the pagan perspective. This is the Christian perspective. God set the stage. He entered into the times and the seasons. He unfolded history and made opportunities so that at just the right moment, one final deliverer would come. As the scriptures started out, God identified himself to a people. He selected and taught them what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. What righteousness looks like. He began using them to chronicle the story of redemption generation after generation bearing witness to our struggle to make ourselves holy only to fail time and time again. Then finally having a generation that was ready to hear the fact that we cannot earn grace. In the fullness of time, God himself entered creation to bring us the good news that his kingdom was at hand, that he would instruct the people in holiness, that he himself would bring signs and wonders to prove his divinity and power that he, the one and only true and living God, would offer a sacrifice that would not only bring a true and everlasting forgiveness, but would also bring a transforming power that would give the believers a new heart. That same God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, would live within us eternally. That's a radical notion. God not only existing next to us, but living inside us. God would change the very nature of humanity back into being the people that we were created to be in the first place. The sons and daughters of God. And we hold to the fact that one day soon he'll return and win the final victory over the enemy. Over that serpent of old, as Revelation tells us. And we'll return creation back to the paradise and perfection. Back to the beauty of that made God himself look around at this world, look around at us and say, it was good. Can you imagine 
what this world would have looked like, what we would have looked like before him, to inspire the creator of all that exists and ever will exist to look at us and say, it, you are good. The season of Advent that we are getting into is, is a season of hope. While this day specifically is set aside for the proclaiming of Christian hope, we look back in time to see the times and the seasons where the people of God were trapped in bondage to their own sin and their short-sightedness and the threat of separation from God. We remember the anticipation of the prophets as the remnant, the few faithful called out by God. The hope they had in a redeemer who would give them a new heart and the gift of an eternity with God. Life everlasting. And yet we also read and remember the opportunities that God took to bring that deliverer, Jesus, into this fallen world and rescue the people of God. And now that we, the people of God of today, have heard the witness of divine love, we look forward to the day when our hope will become complete, when our faith will be made sight. Citizens of a kingdom without wanted hopelessness, a kingdom where unending life is lived in love and unending joy. Thank you for joining us at Highland Baptist Church. We pray that you were blessed by today's message. We believe that when you love God, you share his word. And when you love others, you spread the gospel. We hope that you're planning on joining us again next time and would love for you to join us in person. To learn more or to donate to our ongoing ministry, please visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Once again, thank you, and may God bless you and keep you.